Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Bob Seeley's still talking. Uh, the good news is we've got George back, George in Hillingdon. Hello. Hi, Sheila. Can you hear me a bit better? That's better. That's better. Let's go back to the beginning. You do want this general election? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, a, a lot of uh, well, pe people that I know, you know, my friends and family, we, we all want a general election, not because we all totally agree on everything, um, not because we all hold the exact same views on everything, but uh, I think the general feeling across the country, from from in my opinion, is that we need an election now in order to um, make sure that this paralysis ends. And with the Brexit party, that's who I'm going to be voting for. Um, what upsets me is when people label Brexit party voters or supporters as far right and um, and you know sort of extreme. I mean because. There's a lot of people that you would probably refer to as left-leaning that are also voting for the Brexit party. I mean, um, but what a lot of people probably don't know is Bob Crow, uh, leader who was um, lead, uh, RMT union leader. He um, found he was one of the founders of No to EU, Yes to Democracy, um, which was a campaign group. And what he said was that uh, the EU is bad for workers' rights and. Uh, because of open door immigration and undercutting wages, and I agree with I agree with his point of view, and also the other point of view that it stifles business and the, the, the red tape, the bureaucracy um, is just. But I think the concern. I think you're right about Bob Crow. I think the concern that a lot of people have about. Um, uh, leaving the EU is the sheer scale and size of the market that we are in currently, the, the single market that we are in currently mm. in, in the European Union. It, everything else is dwarfed by comparison. Now, there is an argument that the, that the world is changing, that the world of global trade is changing and we need to be free enough to go and do business elsewhere in the way that we see fit. There's an argument for that, of course there is. But those, um, mm. I don't know, perhaps more cautious individuals would say, but look, on our doorstep is a functioning, thriving, huge market that we have anyway. Why would we turn our backs on that? That's that, in, in a nutshell, I think that's how an awful lot of people feel about why it's, it's a bad idea to leave the EU. No, I, I understand that point of view, but like Nigel Farage said, we can. It's a bit like living on a street. You know, we can still be perfectly good neighbours and cooperate and all trade with each other. I mean, the EU was a great thing when it was about trade, but it's become more and more about closer and closer political integration through the back door, without the consent of individual citizen countries. The trade has always come and with politics, hasn't it? It always has. I mean, people used well, to yeah, people yeah. used to marry yeah. their daughters off to people for for trade. <laughs> you know, trade has yeah. trade has always been a a very human business. You know, it's a, and and therefore a political business. But but I, I think that argument has been had. I mean, the reason we had a referendum in the first place was because precisely because we couldn't agree on it. So we then had a referendum, and then in order to make a decision. And now that that decision's been made, it, it feels like and. And you, know, and you say we just have we have to honour the result. You say you're going to vote for the Brexit Party in all likelihood in the general election. Is that uh, yes. is that so that there are Brexit MPs in the House, Brexit Party MPs in the House of Commons, or is it so that um, that you configure Parliament in such a way, with or without Brexit MPs, that that your vote gives other parties a bit of a shock and a reminder that they need to deliver Brexit? Well, yeah, kind of a bit of both. I mean, I, I want to see people like Nigel Farage and uh, Ben Habib and uh, people that, I, that for, in my opinion, have been there and done it in proper jobs. And actually, they they understand what is actually going on out there in, in terms of trade, rather than career politicians that are just lecturing everybody without actually really knowing what they're talking about. <laughs> and I think... 
the Brexit party will pull votes from, you know, it's not about left or right, it's well, about... Well, although a huge number it's, of the it's business... About, it's about forward, it's about going forward. Yes, but a huge number of the business associations, the trade associations in this country uh, are not for Brexit, are they? I mean, they, they mostly say that the, the uncertainty over it is, is, is causing harm, but they're not massively supportive it's, it's, of Brexit in big numbers, are they? I mean, I know what you mean, but some people, I mean, I... I this is, you could say this isn't backed up by evidence, and you'd probably be right, but it's a bit of a conspiracy theory. But I think it's because they are work, working behind closed doors in order to just, that they don't care about small business. I think they want to stifle small business and monopolise the market, but like the big corporations, whereas this the Brexit vote, a bit like with the Trump vote in America, it's people saying, actually, we want... We want to actually be not be ignored anymore, and to, to sort of. Sorry, I'm I'm just kind of struggling to. No, no, but I, no, I, th I think I think you're doing fine in doing that because I think that sense of being ignored um, in, in in many voters' hearts and minds was was key to the Brexit vote. George, great to talk to you. Thank you, uh, Marie in Castleford in West Yorkshire. Hello there. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. Pleasure, Sheila. pleasure. Um, if I can just say thank you for keeping me company every day as well, because oh. I'm not well, and I'm always in every day, so I listen every day. Well, I'm delighted and to be able to help yeah, you in that small company, way. Yeah, you so thank you. Good. It's a big part of people like mine's life. Um, so, yes, I live in Yvette Cooper's constituency in Castleford, um, and I would love the just some reform around here, just some belief for the local people that change can happen, you know, because the area is so deprived, um, Sheila, that the, um, the, all of the people that live here, they, they just, we have no swimming pools, all of the towns being closed down, and obviously the elderly people that live here that have relied, you know, for all of their lives on local amenities, mm. they're just all gradually disappearing, and it would just be fabulous for the area to see that we can make a difference, you know, by, by a political change. Can uh, I, just can I just... Can I, can I come in on that? Yeah, um, yes, of course. Although, yeah. although you have a Labour MP, for the past 10 years, you've had a Conservative government or a Conservative-led government in the coalition. So Labour haven't really had 10 years' worth of power um, in Castleford to make the kind of changes that, that you're looking for, as a government, I mean. And yet you no. still, you're holding yes. them responsible, are you, Be because you have a Labour MP? I am, yes. I do fully hold them responsible, yeah, because the things that have happened in the area, Sheila, um, is down to the Labour MP. You know, for example, we had um, we were trying to stop the A&E department being closed because we have a, a, it's a big constituency yeah. and it's a very long way to get to a, an A&E with the one clo that mm. is now being closed. Um, and yeah, I do, I hold it responsible but can I just ask you but can I ask but but do you get the fact that she's not in power yeah, she's there I trying to represent to Castleford and 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 speak for constituents like you in Parliament and and to power but she her party doesn't have power isn't in power no, and I appreciate that, but she's also in a 70% leave constituency, Sheila. She's not honoured that. You know, the only thing that she's campaigned for is to leave. She doesn't take any notice to remain, of the constituents you mean. in the area. You mean to remain? And that's just because it's such a Labour stronghold. She doesn't even have to campaign, you know. She, it's just an automatic election for it. The same as it was for her husband until last time he got a real big shock uh, when did. Ed Balls got when Ed Balls got voted out at Marley and he was exactly the same um, politician as she is in our area and it was the biggest shock of his life when a Conservative MP got into Marley and they showed the people of Marley that they could make change. And um, that, Marie, as I recall, that was because a UKIP candidate um, no, it's a, but was as it, far as I'm aware, Sheila, it's a Conservative candidate that got in in Marley. Yeah, no, but I'm saying, was that not because you, UKIP waded in and disrupted the vote in some way? I'm, I might be misremembering that, but but you're absolutely right. It, it, it was a shock that Ed Balls lost that seat. So are you saying that in this election, do you believe the Conservatives can overturn that majority that, that, that Yvette Cooper has? 
I do, yeah, I do. I believe that, yeah, I definitely believe that if somebody came to the area and saw just how we have nothing at, at all. I mean, wait for your council, Sheila. They, they've even sold all the local car parks off. So in the town centre, even all the car parks have been privatised. Everything. And I'm really sorry, I, I understand what you're saying, but I also travel down south and I see the difference in, in the north and south divide. I'm sure you do as well. I do. And I see... Although, can I just say on that, Marie, that's not absolute either. There's poverty in London and there's poverty in the southeast of England every bit as much yeah. as there is in the north you know it's it's yeah. it's differently it's differently spread but it's definitely there yeah so listen if i i presume then that if you want a conservative to win in castleford you don't want the brexit party to be poking its nose in in that constituency no, during I the general like election either. oh yeah no ah, but if there's both are, you yeah. see marie if there's both brexit party and conservative party represented in that constituency that splits the leave vote and makes Yvette Cooper's position all the stronger. Oh, of course, yeah, of course it does, yeah. And if Absolutely. you were, but if they do, and you're making a choice between the Brexit Party and Tory Party, what are you going to choose? I don't know until they've campaigned. You know, I'd make that decision. It would just be nice to have a choice to feel that if you are going to vote, it would, you know, there is a possibility that there could be change. Well, listen, if if you get a knock on the door from any of them, we any of any of the above, anything, Sheila, oh, well, I hope you do. And if you do, call us and tell us how that went. Marie, thank you. Great that you, we've spoken for the first time. Thank you very much indeed, Marie in Castleford. Paul has called from Canterbury. Uh, Paul, it's the 31st of October. We are still in the European Union. What do you say? I'm not surprised, to be honest. I've lost total faith in it all. Um, I'm a Brexiteer and I was really looking forward to celebrating this day rather than celebrating Halloween. But I'm, I think an understatement of betrayal is, is that. It is an understatement. And I'm just fed up with the whole I mean, it's more than the whole lot of it because they're all total liars, the lot of them. And the only reason why we're in this mess and haven't left today is the like of the Letwin and the Ben Act and all those Remainer MPs that don't want us to leave. And they're all smiling all the way to the bank now, aren't they, really? Because, well, maybe not, because I don't think they're going to get their seats in the general election. And that's now the chance for the, the leavers of this country to vote with their feet and say, enough's enough and get rid of these people from their seats and hopefully having an election where Brexit can be seen through because it's well, an it's worth Well, it's worth now. reminding ourselves, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you're absolutely perfectly within your rights, Paul, to feel the way you feel about the, the, the state of play on Brexit. Nothing wrong with that. But it's worth remembering that the parliament that we have is the parliament that was voted in last time around, isn't it? I totally agree, and I think the 27th election was a bit of a warning shot and it did make me sit up and think. So that in what Brexit, way? In what I way? In what way? Well, I couldn't care about politics until Brexit. And it's only now that I've actually really, really got to, gr to grips with it. And I started seeing the sliding scale happen, that the fact we were the possibility we weren't going to leave, when the sums were there, there were too many Remainer MPs, then there were those that should be standing against their constituents. Yes, but, but I repeat my point, that the, that the MPs, whatever their view on Brexit, were in there because citizens of this country put them there with their vote. Yes, but there are also Remainer MPs that um, represent constituencies where the majority was leave. But they decided not and, to... No, but and yet, that. but Paul, Major. Paul, Paul, and yet... See, I, th I think you're not quite getting what I'm, what I'm saying. It, it, it doesn't matter if the constituency voted leave, because if at the general election, the subsequent general election, an MP who had stated, think of somebody like Dominic Grieve, an MP who yeah. stated clearly time and time again, he thinks it's a bad idea, and he still got elected to parliament. So, 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 take, so taking that view back into parliament and exercising his judgment based on that view is perfectly legitimate. You're quite within your rights to not like it. Boris Johnson is quite within his rights to be frustrated that it's getting in his way. But it's perfectly legitimate and democratic and representative. That I, that, and, and, I, and, and, I, and yes, I agree with you in that respect. And I think that's why we are in this sorry mess, because the, the way our elections are, are, are ran, held and decided. And having a non-majority government really hasn't helped. And that's why I wish that Mrs May didn't do the 
you know, didn't do it in that respect because I think if we didn't have that 2017 election, we wouldn't be where we are now. We may have left by now. But I just wish and I hope that well, on when, that, the, when Paul, the country you know, decides to leave, the MPs should stand by that yeah. decision. No but, matter what their decisions are, I'm feeling. But on that question of whether, if Theresa May, you know, let's let's play what if for a second, if she hadn't called that 2017 election, uh, you're more confident that Brexit would have got through. I'm not more confident. I'm not more confident that Brexit would have got through under Theresa May uh, with with, this, with with that majority because. For the, you, I think you're you're forgetting, are you, that at the very beginning, well, for for a big chunk of the three years since the election, since, since the yeah. referendum, Brexit is in her own party with the people giving her a kicking more than Remainers. Well, she was never a Brexiteer, was she really, from the beginning? So, what do you was... want from Brexit? Because Boris Johnson's deal, what do you think it's better than Theresa May's deal? Do you know, I've got to the stage I don't really care. <laughs> well, I just want out. Come I don't on, care how got... we do it. Well, but the thing is, you know, you said she's not a Brexiter. She delivered a Brexit deal that Boris Johnson and others in the in the party have only recently said is 90% the same as theirs. Yeah, but it's right. Everyone says there was no deal in the referendum. There was no, so there was no, no deal in the referendum, but there was also no deal in the referendum. The referendum said leave, and that's what it meant. Get out then deal with it and that's how we should have done it all this deal with may and boris and all this no deal nonsense it's just euphemisms it's just words it's just narrative they don't mean or hold anything we should have just turned around on it, after the day after the referendum and said to the uncle whoever thank you very much nice knowing you Ta-ra. But, but paul you know you, you've admitted it yourself you don't care about the detail the detail matters it's people's it does lives matter paul. now of course it, it matters. always mattered. It always mattered. It, you can't be in a 40-year arrangement, walk out of it and think that the detail isn't going to bite you on the backside. But we should be having a 40... Uh, I, I get what you're saying, I do. Uh, this is the problem I have with all my friends when we sit and have an argument over a pint of beer over it. <laughs> you know, my brothers are remain and I'm a Brexiteer and we wear at each other's throats constantly. Oh, you've got to but, keep it civil. <laughs> <laughs> well, well no, I, I, you, you, you said about keeping it simple. I mean, I watched something on this morning, or GMB, whatever it's called, and they were saying about MPs feeling threatened and uh, assaulted and shouted at and yeah. spat at and everything else. Yeah. I don't condone that, but all that is brought upon themselves. No, it's not. Because if they didn't lie over the years and claim false expenses and treat this country like we're stupid idiots... I don't think they'd get hard. But Paul, of it. but Paul, you are, I'm afraid, if I may, with respect, you're being guilty of the, the lack of detail thing again. Because, uh, yeah, absolutely the expenses scandal was a scandal and needed to be looked at. But to, yeah. but to then switch off your critical faculties and then say it's actually just okay for a woman MP to be terrorised because of that, not knowing A, what her expenses situation was, not knowing whether she's ever lied to you or not, it's just. It's really dangerous, Paul, because the, sec yeah, like because said, the second... Because the second... Well, you, yes, but you said but, and there can be no but after that. There can be no but after that. The, 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 the second you say, well, it's understandable, isn't it, that she's getting abuse, you wait. It won't be long before you, your wife, your daughter, your sister is part of that victim group as well. It must not be where we where we go with our politics. It cannot be. I lived it to a small, small degree watching this in Liverpool in the 80s and early 90s. And it is it, it is so it's so um, sort of cancerous and damaging to a community if people start saying, yeah, but she's a Tory, isn't she? So, uh, or she's a this, so uh, it's dangerous, Paul, really yeah, dangerous. Don't, but don't cause the issue in the first place. That's, that's, that's yeah. like saying, that's like a domestic, I'm not saying you are, it's like saying, no. a, a domestic abuser saying, but she really got on my nerves. That's why I hit her in the face, officer. Yeah, but I've actually spoken to somebody who turned around and said, if they live the life like I do, going to food banks, not having a pot to pee in, not having money in the bank, they're on £75,000 a year and all they do is lie to us and treat us like idiots, they deserve what's coming to them. There is absolute true hatred about the way that we, not just with Brexit, but 
the way that the MPs have treated yeah, this, and, and this country. And, and Paul, you'll never hear from me that MPs are special cases. They're not special cases, but they are sure. human beings. As your friend who's in those difficulties is a human being. Of course, people have the right to be frustrated and the right to be angry about the political situation that many people are living in. I'm angry. The thing that makes me most angry is young working families who can't afford a pair of yeah. shoes for their kids. If you're not angry about yeah. that, there's something wrong with you. The thing that makes me angry is old people who leave a hospital and go to a cold home and wait for that one 15 minute from a carer because their family has abandoned them. They don't have family and if they don't have family, their community has abandoned them. That makes me angry too and I know that goes on every single day in this country. But the answer to that is never to abuse politicians or one and another. I, and like I said, I don't, I don't, but what I think, I think one thing we will always agree on, you and I, this country is in a mess. Not a completely. Total, not completely in a mess. Because good people and good conversations and good decisions and good politics are the thing that will help it. Bad politics, bad conversations, bad people won't solve it. And that's where we are at the moment. Well, I think we'll I think we'll have to talk again, Paul, and find more common ground. I think we have a lot of it, but we didn't quite get there today. Thank you very much. That's Paul in Canterbury. Well, at 11 o'clock this morning, the Brexit party will announce its election strategy. And Nigel Farage is expected to confirm where his party will be standing candidates in next month's general election. One of the constituencies that he's being tipped for is Thurrock in Essex, where more than 70% of referendum voters chose to leave the EU. Seema Katecha reports from there. Underneath a skyline of giant cranes lies Tilbury. A social housing estate surrounds a dozen or so shops, including a barber's, a taxi service and a couple of cafes. I'm not far right as National Front used to be, but BMP is around about how right wing I am personally. Yeah. That's Andy. Like more than 70% of the people who live in the constituency of Thurrock, he voted to leave the EU. He argues that heavy migration leads to the loss of a country's identity and says the Brexit party could help slim down the number of foreigners. In my opinion, race and culture go hand in hand. And in able to protect culture, you need to protect race. And that's why it's important to have a level of national identity. So you're I'll saying you're not racist? No, of course not. No. I've had a couple of calls from people who were waiting to contribute to the Donald Trump conversation. So we, we shall um, get those out of the way, out of courtesy. We get people hanging on for so long. And then we'll move into this astonishing new chapter in, in post-truth uh, or Brexit politics. Uh, James is in Islington. James, what would you like to say? Good afternoon, James. Um, I must say, I'm a regular listener to yourself and uh, your colleagues as well. Um, what I would say is, um, in regards to what you've been saying earlier on, I've seen obviously you and uh, one of the previous callers have gone and gone on about Trump being a racist. Now, I think that it's a bit far-fetched. Uh, he, he obviously has come out with things that are very stupid to say. However, what I will say in regards to that is, in regards to ethnic minority employment rate in America, it's at a record low now. So... Um, yeah, and mate, the, 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 the racism line is about telling people who were born in America to go back where they came from. So let, let's just oh, park I that really and move on. I appreciate what you're saying. That. Good. Um, Cause, cause, actually the, the, the Trump and Farage interview last night, yes. I did listen to that, and I was quite impressed with what he had to say. Admittedly, obviously... Because you already like him, and you don't think... Humanist. You already like him, and you don't think he's a racist. Well, I don't think... So. I will say racist a bit far fetched so maybe he's come out with idiotic comments, or I'd say that... Yeah, but that, te telling but people who were born in America to go back where they came from isn't idiotic or far-fetched, my friend. It's racist. No, yes, it's in Down's interpretation. In no, 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 it really it's, isn't. It's, no, obviously, we we'll, we'll obviously disagree on this issue. Mm. However, no, for the point I was going to call to make is... Let, I mean, me, let, let, me guess. Let, let me guess what the point you were going to make was. Okay. I think it was really bad for Jeremy Corbyn that Donald Trump criticised him and good for Boris Johnson that he praised him. Well, uh, you know, you hit the nail on the head. So I personally do think that is the reason. The best, uh, God, let me ask you why. Analogy. Well, the reason I think that is purely I live in Islington, which is a very Remain and obviously Jeremy Corbyn. Right, mate, I'm going to have to wait. Um, I'm going to have to wait for the biography to, to to find out more details. Why do you think it was bad for Jeremy Corbyn to be well, criticised by Donald Trump? Well, the U.S. is our biggest ally. There's no denying that. With the U.S., the U.S. was our biggest ally when Barack Obama told us not to do Brexit. Did you did you applaud him? 
Oh, well, look, obviously not. But however, oh, why obviously? With, with Trump, why obviously not? Out, he's, he's, he's promoting a free trade deal. Why obviously not? Well, because, personally, I've supported Brexit. I don't... I oh, so it's got nothing to do with America's status or its relationship with us, So, and everything to do with whether or not Donald Trump says something you agree with. But anyway, let's just focus on the central question. I'll remind you what it is. Why do you think it's bad for Corbyn to be criticised by Donald Trump? I personally think it's bad for Corbyn, purely for the fact is that uh, yes. Trump's come out, he said he wants a, a free trade deal with the United Kingdom, and he has obviously said that with Boris's deal, there may be limitations to how far... Yes, but why is any of this bad trade. for Corbyn? Well, it's bad for Corbyn, because Corbyn sat on the fence throughout the entire Brexit process, and he used... But why, why does Donald lot. Trump criticising Corbyn do damage to Corbyn? Well, because a lot of people, especially, well, maybe not in London, but when you leave London, people aren't that keen on Corbyn. Obviously, he's got a lot of... Yeah, but that's not an history. answer to the question I asked, is it? You're telling me about people who already don't like Corbyn. Why would being criticised by Donald Trump be bad for Jeremy Corbyn? Well, it would be, it would be bad for Jeremy Corbyn because a lot Wh of people... Why, James? America's our largest ally, and if the leader of the United States is openly saying that Corbyn would be bad... But the leader of the United States the openly said that Brexit was bad and it didn't change your mind about anything, did it? It, it didn't. So it, let's it, go it back didn't. to the question that you've rung in to answer for the seventh time of asking. Why would being criticised by Donald Trump last night be bad news for Jeremy Corbyn? Well, because all Brexit, to anyone who wants Brexit to succeed, anyone... But uh, anyone who wants Democrat. Brexit to succeed is not going to have been planning to vote for Jeremy Corbyn, are they? So let's try well, for the eighth not time. Necess not necessarily. What, what, why? They may well have. You've got the Labour leave areas in the north. They could well be voting for Labour. And there's a lot of places where you could put a Labour vote on a donkey and they would vote for Labour. You, you, I know it's it's, it's, it's just there. like we're having a sort of word salad. I, 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 listen, I'm not, I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you 11 times, but I will ask you once more. In, in terms of people who had a position on Jeremy Corbyn at 5 o'clock yesterday and then heard Donald Trump criticise Jeremy Corbyn, and you believe that that might have made them look more negatively at Jeremy Corbyn. Just explain your thinking to me. How would that have happened? Because he's promoting the free trade deal with the United Kingdom. Now, anyone who wants Brexit to succeed or oh, wants that, to mate. move forward... I, I, well, I, I, I just can't do this anymore. L last chance, all right? Why is it bad for Corbyn? To, because he criticised Johnson as well, James. I don't know if you missed that bit. Oh, no, I know, yeah, I know. Good. I know. So why is, it, but why is it good for Johnson and bad for Corbyn? Well, because... He's, well, he, number, there's a number of reasons for it. Well, just for one. I'd, I'd kill for one at the moment, mate. Well, at the end of the day, this is the... Jeremy Corbyn could potentially become Prime Minister. Now, well we spotted. We've a good working relationship with our closest... But he criticised Johnson's leader, deal as well. He criticised Johnson's yeah, deal as well. So how Johnson, is that good for he? Johnson? Johnson is a great guy on yes. numerous occasions. Yes, but, but he criticised the withdrawal agreement that the whole election was called about. So how can he be good for Johnson and bad for Corbyn? Well, because he's promoting a free trade agreement. He says he wants a free trade agreement with the He said he didn't now. want Johnson. So how is it good for Johnson, for Donald Trump to say, I don't want the thing that you, you can offer but me? He didn't, he, didn't say anything. he didn't say it's not oh, Johnson. Oh, I've good. done my bit, honestly. I, I, it's not a charity, it's a radio programme. It's coming up to 12 minutes after 12. You stay safe, James, at the end of the day. So, John in Eastbourne, should Boris Johnson at least consider Nigel Farage's offer of an election pact? I certainly think you should, Sheila. I mean, what I would like to just make two quick points, if I may. Yeah. I mean, I think any potential uh, future leader in this country, the last thing they should be doing is, you know, snubbing the hand of friendship uh, from America, you know, regardless of if, uh, if they sort of think Trump's a good guy or not. And obviously... Uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn has done this. He's made an enemy of John uh, 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 of Trump straight away. And also, I'd just like to say, obviously, there was over five million Labour voters that did vote for Brexit. And I think, come the general election, a lot of them votes are probably going to go to the Brexit Party. And I think Labour uh, could well get slaughtered at the, at the polls. And I certainly hope that is the case because of Brexit. Well, yeah, because of Brexit, because I, I, I admire people that stick by, stick by their guns and say they're going to do what they say they're going to do. And Jeremy Corbyn has totally changed, isn't he? The only reason those five million people voted for Labour was because they thought Jeremy Corbyn was going to see Brexit through. And obviously he snubbed all them people well, now. You, well, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You just heard from Laura Parker of Momentum 
that, yeah. that that's precisely what they intend to offer and are offering at the general election, which is a Jeremy Corbyn-led government goes back to the EU, gets a Brexit deal, comes back to the Commons and uh, gets it through on the promise of a people's <coughs> vote attached to it as well. Yeah, but the trouble is, Sheila, we've had three and a half years of this. Do no, we the still, time do isn't... We, no, 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 we, I'm not going to let you talk about time. Content. Content. What's the problem well, with that policy? I just think the British people, it, when, when it comes to a general election, they are going to be given a choice. If they vote for the Brexit Party, they know that uh, that will be enacted. If they, if they vote for Labour, they, they know that Jeremy Corbyn is going to have to go back with his begging bowl back to the EU. And it's all an unknown entity. We don't know if he's going to get any better deal. It, I, I think people are just, generally speaking, people are just sick to death of Brexit, aren't they, really? No, I'm not. Well, I know, obviously, Sheila, look, I mean, I know you're I'm not, we, no, but I'm not, we have, to, we have to be responsible, we have to be patient, we have to work it out sensibly, and even when uh, it's done, it's not done, if you see what I mean. When this phase is done, if we get to that point, um, that's just the beginning. I was at an event last night listening to some very, uh, you know, involved, intelligent people in this, explaining just quite how arduous that trade negotiation is going to be. <laughs> Um, issue, after we yeah. leave. But that's the yeah. detail that matters, John, and that's the detail that has to come out in this general election about that deal, that it is not the end of anything. At the end of the day, Sheila, we have to consider that every, with every single month of delay, the British taxpayers are having to pay another billion pounds into the EU. I mean, we've been in the EU now for 40 years. I mean, can you tell me how many billions of pounds the taxpayers have paid into that system in the last 40 years? It and got back out of it. Sorry? And got back out of it as members. Yeah, got out of it a fraction of what we're putting into it. Well, this can you, speaking of billions, realize. can you tell me how much um, we've spent on Brexit planning? I can tell I you if you want. I'll tell, tell, tell you one quick point I'd like to make. 6.3 billion is the answer. Of course make you are. This point. I'm just giving you a number. You gave me one. I'm giving you one. Well, what, what's the point you want to put to me? Sorry. That, that you're talking about how much money we've wasted in the EU. Total UK spending on Brexit planning is now 6.3 billion. All I know is that we've paid a hell of a lot in, haven't we? And then, um, one, the other quick thing I'd like to say, if I may, I heard Boris Johnson three times now in the House of Commons putting a very good point forward. I mean, in, in this country, we consider ourselves to be, you know, very humane towards livestock and whatever. Boris Johnson put a very good point forward. He said, all the time we remain EU members, we have to continue this shocking trade of live, lives sorry, livestock exports to, to the continent. And obviously, if we, if we was to enact Brexit and come out, we could stop that disgusting trade going on. And that's an important issue, I think, for a lot of And when of did that start to bother you? It has always bothered me. I think if you, go, if you go down to the Ramsgate docks in July time and you see all these sheep being loaded onto these cattle trucks when the temperatures are uh, well up in the 70s, mm -hmm. I mean, surely that is not a thing we should be condoning and carrying on with. And is that, is that a big issue for you in this? I think it should be any, a big issue for anyone that's got any humane concerns. It should be an issue to you. I mean, sure, are, are you happy to see that kind of trade going on every, every, every day in the summertime? No, I haven't seen it, but no, I'm not happy. No, but there's all kinds of things I'm not happy about in, in, in our politics, and, and we can campaign to change them, and, and you see Brexit as a means of changing that. Well, I certainly do, Sheila. That's just one topic I've just brought up. I mean, obviously, that is one consideration, surely, you should consider. I know it's not, the, it's not going to be the main issue you want to talk about today, but it is just one of many issues, isn't it? All right, John, thank you for your call. John in Eastbourne, Chris in Crawley. Hi, Chris. Hi, Sheila. Uh, I'm just ringing to say, basically, that... Um, Whilst listening to Donald Trump and Nigel Farage yesterday, uh, Donald Trump clearly did say that he probably does think that Jeremy Corbyn is a very nice man and then went on to attack his ideology. Um, if you notice anything about Trump, he would always do that. He would always praise the man first and then attack the ideology. Unlike the left, who normally will attack Donald Trump on his personality and everything else uh, before attacking his ideology. And I think that's um, a little bit... Um, I think you're being a bit generous not... to Trump to say that he always does that, Chris. Um, he well, he, he, he also... himself first. 
Unless he has attacked himself first, and then he will he will attack, as we know. And it's well proven. And, um, you know, okay, okay, you give me an example when he attacks people first. I can't off the top of my head. I can, I can think of... So, in actual fact, so I do believe that the Labour Party would be uh, far better off by just um, using this as a, just a small news clip and moving on to their own agenda. Which is exactly what they will do. They're only answering questions because we're asking them. Well, well, I guess they are, but, um, you know, we can keep making hay of Donald Trump and everything else, but uh, and Boris Johnson thrown into it. But I think Jeremy... Um, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party should uh, well leave this alone and uh, move on to whatever their agenda is. The, the, the interesting thing about what he said about the NHS, though, they can't quite leave alone, can they? Because there will be those who will point to what Donald Trump said, uh, those in the Conservatives, who they'll say every time Labour says, you, you want to sell the NHS off, you want to sell it to America, you want drugs to be more expensive, they'll say, didn't you hear him on LBC saying, I don't know where this came from, I mean, and Labour, if they've got any sense, will counter with, you said it, you said it yourself standing next to Theresa May. So, you know, it, yeah, it's, it, yeah. so, so the, the reason I'm focusing on it is it will be used against them. If you, if you remember the very original question to Donald Trump, uh, uh, by a journalist about the NHS at that conference with Theresa May. Um, he just flippantly said, yes, the NHS is on the table, and later on admitting that he does, didn't even really know what the NHS was. <laughs> so I don't know what you have to say about Donald Trump, but, um, yeah. You it say ignore like him, do you, say Chris? One thing and everybody else can um, interpret it a different way. You say ignore him, do you? Trump? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a great supporter of Donald Trump, but um, I would say ignore him by and large. Why are you a supporter of his? First. Why are you a supporter of his? Why am I a supporter? Yeah. Oh, Sheila, you you need another show for that. Well, go on, in a nutshell. G give me a thumbnail sketch of what's so great about Donald Trump. Okay, uh, from the very beginning, um, I didn't really understand Donald Trump. I thought it was very much a TV show. But the very first week uh, of him coming into power, he signed a very um, strong executive order um, on, I do believe it was on the 16th of November, he signed an executive order um, which was seizing the assets of anyone um, dealing with paedophiles, um, you know, human trafficking, all those kind of issues mm. worldwide. Um, I read the uh, executive order, it seemed genuine, it seemed great, uh, and he seemed to have been following, following it up. So, um, yeah, there's many, many other issues that uh, I like about Trump. Some I don't. Um, his issue with Russia, I don't really like. I prefer that he really does take the initiative what to do you think his issue with, with russia. russia is because um th there are those and i might be one of them who fears that his issue with russia is that he's in the white house to do russia's bidding um i think it's his advisors that have been given him the wrong uh, advice like john bolton uh, for one that's been given him the wrong advice on russia um and also i think erdogan president erdogan has also uh, you know, we could go on and on, Sheila, but at the end of the day, we could um, dislike Donald Trump or like Donald Trump. It's, you know, it's the same as like but, uh, Brexit or not like br Brexit. OK, Chris, thank you. Chris and Crawley. Joe in Houston in Texas. He Joe, hello. Hi, Sheila. Yes, hi. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I, I disagree with you 100% on everything, but uh, I hope yeah, I'm, I'm thankful that you take my call. My uh, pleasure. Well, one of the things... One of the things that I, I like to, you touched on it briefly was, there's a saying, you don't take a gun to, uh, you don't take a knife to a gunfight. Trump has the biggest gun. The thing is, what will be the relationship, strategic relationship between Jeremy Corbyn and Trump's administration? It is not just Corbyn, it's the whole Labour Party. And somebody might say, oh, when he, when Jeremy Corbyn becomes president, he will, uh, you know, the relationship will be better. But... If it doesn't, that's a national security risk for the United Kingdom. Because relationship with America is not just about, uh, you know, trade. 
it's about security, especially when it comes to the UK, being that you and guys shall are I tell you what, shall, shall, shall I tell you what it isn't, uh, what it also isn't about, ever? What just, it, just, okay. just two men. You know, or a woman and a man, whoever's in power. It's never, it's never just about those two individuals. I'm sure who the individuals are matters at a certain level. But in terms of the depth of cooperation, the depth of the relationship, the functioning of the shared security issues, that's at a much deeper level than who happens to have won an election. But, but Sheila, if you, uh, if that is what you think, then I'm guessing you haven't really analysed the how. Trump's administration works. I mean, if you listen to the media, you might think he's getting impeached tomorrow, but he's not going to be impeached. The Democrats know it. Everybody in America knows Trump will never be impeached. The Republicans hold the Senate. They, there's no way they're going to vote to impeach Trump. And Trump has 95% of the Republican Party. He, his, his rating is a 95%. So if a country is making a decision on, you know, bashing Trump, he's this, he's that, you have to be strategic in how you, you interact with Trump. Okay, Joe, thank you. On these comments, Donald... Hello. Oh, hello, um, Paul. Go on, far away. Yeah. Don't mind uh, me. Well, uh, Donald Trump, we all know what a lot of people think about him, and I suppose I, I'm one of them, but he's something of a, how can I put it, not too intelligent person, and that comes across in the way he talks, to be absolutely honest. But there is an old saying... But out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, sometimes you get good things. And I must say that what Trump has said about Jeremy Corbyn is absolutely on the money. This guy plans to borrow £250 billion. Pounds. Now, when he does that, what do you think that's going to do to interest rates? It's going to put them up. What the Conservatives should be saying... Uh, and th these are all very sophisticated arguments. We need to break this down to something that ordinary people will understand. Here's a slogan. Vote Labour, your mortgage will go up. Because believe you me, it will. Um, I'm nearly 70 years old. I, my mortgage rate was 15%. Mm. I remember in 1975 when uh, inflation was at 25% under, under a Labour government that was then re, you know, uh, quite moderate uh, by, uh, by Jeremy Corbyn's standards. These, uh, uh, socialism doesn't work. We've learnt this over but, but many Paul, years. But Paul, isn't the truth as well uh, that uh, the Conservative government post-coalition uh, under George Osborne's um, uh, stewardship of the Treasury, massively outborrowed the plans that Alistair Darling had uh, to respond uh, to the financial that, crash, uh, and and that was at a time and that was at a time when interest rates globally uh, were very low, and certainly here in the UK, massively low for a very long time now, for a decade now, um, and and you know. All, all governments making decisions like that risk interest rates well, going through uh, the roof? Well, yes, but I'll bet you anything you like that uh, uh, initial, uh, Corbyn's initial shot, I agree he's come off this now, but his initial shot was to borrow $500 billion. Uh, I, I agree that he's, uh, he's cut that down to $250 billion now. But even so, Would you be more relaxed um, if it was taxation that raised the money? Well, uh, tax and spend doesn't work either. You see, once again, these are all very sophisticated arguments. He says that he's going to tax corporations. Now, who are the main shareholders in corporations? Pension funds, insurance companies. So that means he's going to take the money from our pensions. Uh, the money has to come from somewhere. And what Boris Johnson is saying that he can spend, the reason, as he's pointed out, that he can spend it 
is because of the austerity of the last 10 years. Now, I wish I could remember the statistic that I heard, but it was very interesting. The, um, uh, the, debt, the debt to um, income ratio of this country has come right down. But isn't the, um, isn't the uh, political uh, truth of all of that, Paul, and there's going to be a reckoning for that political truth in the next six weeks, one way or another, isn't the political truth, it will either have worked for them or not, I mean, it did in 2015, so maybe it will work for them, that they actually uh, brought in the austerity measures um, and the people who most paid the price for those austerity measures were people who probably weren't going to vote Tory anyway, was the calculation. Uh, that might be true, but then I'm taken back to what a minister said in the 1980s, and he's absolutely right, that the poor, who we all care about, and don't think that I don't care about people I see sleeping rough on the streets. It breaks my heart every time I see one. Uh, and I try and give them a few bob. You know, um, we all care about them. But the poor are better off under a capitalist system that generates wealth. Before you spend the wealth, you've got to generate it first. And that, in, that means having... Uh, people, uh, I mean, a, a Labour MP on on your show a couple of days ago was saying that he doesn't want to see any billionaires in the country. Now, I, I'm no billionaire and I wouldn't even want to be one. But the fact is that people like Rupert Murdoch create wealth. And without wealth creation, you cannot have wealth to spend on taking people off the street. All right, Paul, thank you. Tony has called from Folkestone and Andy in Brentwood to talk about uh, Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson. Uh, who's the other one? Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson. <laughs> oh, yeah, Donald <laughs> Trump. Um, are they a positive change? They're certainly a change. Are they a positive change? Sheila. Tony. This is Tony. Uh, talking about age, the gentleman earlier said he was 72. I'm, I'm 80 next year. I was in business, so I've got a little bit of an idea how to run things. And running Britain is running a country, running a business. Uh, we're dealing with three loose cannons here. We've got Boris, uh, Trump and Nigel Farage. They're the, not the normal politicians that we've used to over the years. Uh, I believe that Mr Corbyn's out of his depth. When he talks about raising the minimum wage, I was in business to make a profit. I would have to increase prices to be able to pay the minimum wage for those in employment. People unemployed wouldn't get the benefit of the rise in wages. So where Mr Corbyn's coming from, people unemployed would have to pay those higher prices that I would have to impose. Uh, people talk about Mr Trump as being an idiot just because he's not a member of the country club. He can't be that silly to be so rich. What do you mean he's not God's a member sake. of the country club? He's, I mean, he is, he is he the epitome the country of club. country club. He spends half he his life in a flipping club. country club. Exactly. But the man's not stupid to be so rich. So when people come onto your programme and say he's an idiot, I bet you're a lot richer than them <laughs> for yeah, being not, so silly. Yeah, it's not all about riches, though, is it? Well, it, yeah. Success you know, sanity, yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. But we're talking about something a lot more than anyone's financial success and certainly his financial success. We're talking about what they are doing to... Uh, to politics and, and what they are part of in politics, which is this uh, post-financial crash tsunami of um, uh, populism, um, often but not exclusively led by men of a particular kind of character type, it seems to me. I mean, we'll throw um, Marine Le Pen in the mix as well. Um, yeah. they, they, but, but she was around before they really took, a, a, took hold of things. She inherited things from her father in France, didn't she, Jean-Marie Le Pen? But, sure. But what, d d fundamentally, do you think this is a positive sweep in our political history or a negative and dangerous one? I think we're living in a different world. When Mr Trump puts his nose into our business, that's a un very unusual thing. It wouldn't have happened years ago. It just would not have happened. And this is why I started my conversation with you, by saying that we've got three loose cannons. 
they're dealing with with the public in a different way. And when you get Joe Swinton talking about not coming out of uh, the EU yeah. and staying in, diplomacy, for God's sake, we voted to come out. No, but she's Are not... they treating us like morons to, to no. say, I'm no, going to no, keep no, us no, in? No, 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 no. She is saying if in the general election, and again, this is unlikely, but hey, who knows, if in the general election the Lib Dems have a majority, you know, Tony, I know that would be a political earthquake bar none in this country. Of course, if of course. She, if she got that, having campaigned, her party having campaigned for six weeks to revoke if they get the mandate to revoke, if they get that mandate, that's a legitimate mandate. Of course, of course. So it's not that crazy, is it? She's just saying what well, she believes what, in. Yeah, but what is crazy is if the diplomatic vote was to come out and she is standing there saying, my view is that we stay in, that's going against public opinion. No, I'm sorry, but after an earth-shattering, changing... Um, general election, which absolutely trumps a referendum, if you'll pardon the pun, it trumps a referendum, um, then she would have every right to do what she said she would do, campaigning for six weeks to do it and then overturning British politics like nobody ever has. I mean, I don't think this well, is going to happen, but, you know, she would have, that, that would be a democratic mandate without a doubt. Well, my, you know, perhaps I'm getting silly in my old age, but when we talk about diplomacy and the referendum said... The decision Demo you mean democracy, do you, Tony? Democracy, yeah, democracy said that we, 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 we come out of the EU. For God's sake, let's come out. No, I, I hear you, I hear you, but a couple of things. We haven't yet, and the Prime Minister... No, no let, let me finish. The Prime Minister, Go Boris Johnson, got a positive vote in the House of Commons for his Brexit deal, and then he pushed for a general election instead. So, here we are. We have a general election. If yeah. the result of that general election upends or Brexit or changes the nature of Brexit, tough, there's been a general election. That's what he wants it for. What he wants it for is to give himself the votes to be able to carry it through, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And if at the end of it he gets that, on he goes, he carries it through. If at the end of that yes, he doesn't, yes. no, but if, if at the end of that he doesn't, then the UK has democratically sent him a message that it wants something else. Yes, I totally agree with that. But so it's, at the so moment, it's still it's democratic. Easy. It's all still yeah. democratic. Yeah, yeah. It's up and down to me. I'm getting old. <laughs> old and silly. No, God's you're sake. not. You're not old. Also, well, you, I, I can't comment on your age, but you're not silly. Um, <laughs> and, and Tony, do you, when you say they're all unpredictable characters, and do, do you admire any of those traits? Do you admire the, the kind of simple certainty that they like to offer, whether it's true or not? I mean, Boris Johnson keeps saying, let's get Brexit done. Brexit isn't going to be done for a decade. But, but it's um, Corbyn that stood in the way of the vote going through in respect of Boris getting us out by October 31st. About October, you, it's not. That's nonsense. It's nonsense. Well, I think, I think a lot of it is that. That's first. nonsense because the, the 31st was never important if there was a real Brexit deal on the table. Boris Johnson insisted that there was and tried to get Parliament to, uh, well, he didn't want them to scrutinise the bill. We'll do that instead during the election campaign, see, see how that fares. But he didn't, also, he didn't want it properly scrutinised. Sheila. The truth will come out in respect of the terms of, of the uh, leaving. Of the deal. Of the deal. The well, truth will come to. out. We, we will know more as members of the public than we knew when we decided we want to come, wanted to come and, out. And it won't be elected members of parliament finding out for you. It will be journalists finding out for yes, you. Because Donald, yes. not Donald Trump, Freudian slip, because Boris Johnson didn't want it scrutinised properly in parliament. Well, that's a, that's a very good point. Tony, thank you. Good to talk to you. You're Tony and folks, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. How do you read JT without realising that wealth does not equal, equal intelligence, says Jack? Lydia is in East Linton. Hi, Lydia. What do you think of a Leave Alliance? I think that's a, such a good idea. It, it would be amazing if um, Boris could say yes to Nigel. I think Nigel is being very kind, offering um, uh, an olive branch to Boris.
Uh, we all want to um, have Brexit done, but the real Brexit that the people voted for, uh, and so many people, it was the biggest uh, vote in history. So many people with very good faith mm. went to vote. But Lydia, we, we, we can't we say... We, we're we, being betrayed. But Lydia, we can't say from, from the numbers, can we, um, which kind of Brexit people voted for, because we know, There's don't we, that, that people Brexit. voted for... Well, the there is Brexit for you, Lydia. We, there is the for you. Brexit, the Brexit that we were promised was to leave all the institutions of the EU. And that is not going to happen with Boris's treaty. We're but, still going to, going to be tied up and we're going to pay 39, more than 39, I think it's so, 55 billion pounds. Well, there's um, argument about the numbers. But, but Lydia, but Lydia, forgive me, my yeah. central point here yeah. is that while you're very passionate about the kind of Brexit you were voting for, so were lots of other people. Some people wanted uh, something akin to no deal, which was not really talked about much at the time. Many other people assumed there would be a deal. There are a lot, there, some people want to be in the customs union. Some people still want to be in the single market. Those people who want to remain in the customs union are obviously remain. And I don't think they would have voted to leave. Well, well, some, leave some people did, Lydia. And, and I, I wonder whether th this fact, and I, I suggest to you it is a fact that there are lots of different ideas about what sort of Brexit people voted for. Well, Does it not mean... Well, let me, let me ask the question, Lydia, if you'd be so kind. Um, should we not have a referendum? I don't think so. I think that would be very dangerous for our democracy. Democracy means when a vote happens, it has to be implemented. Let's implement a real Brexit part. Then we can have another referendum in 40 years' time. Like, we had to wait since 1973, over 40 years for this. Lydia, thank you. Bye now, please, no more.